Okay, good morning everyone and welcome to the 20th meeting of the Social Justice and Social Security Committee. We have apologies from our convener, Colette Stevenson, the, this morning. Uh, so I'm afraid you're stuck with me as deputy convener. I can apologise for, for not being in the room this morning. Had I anticipated I would be required uh, to convene, I would have been there. So my apologies uh, for that. Uh, no discourtesy was intended. Uh, David Torrance is the substitute member for the SNP on committee, and he may or may not uh, appear this, this morning. Uh, we move to agenda item one, declaration of interest. Uh, I would like to welcome Liz Smith to the committee, who replaces Rose McCall. Can I thank you, Rose, for her valued contribution to the committee? Uh, Liz is a new member of the committee. Uh, do you have any relevant interest that you wish to declare? I have no relevant interest to declare. Thank you, but I look forward to being on the committee. Okay, and it's good to have you here, Liz. Um, I, I think it's the first time I've sat on uh, a committee along with yourself, so I'm looking forward to it. Uh, welcome. Uh, we move to uh, agenda item two, uh, which is subordinate legislation and affirmative SSI. Uh, on the Winter Heating Assistance Pension Age Scotland Regulations 20. 24. Uh, this instrument is laid under the affirmative procedure, which means they can only be made if the Parliament approves them. I welcome to the meeting Shirley Ann Somerville, Cabinet Secretary for Social Justice. I also welcome her officials from the Scottish Government, those being Owen Allen, Team Leader, Winter Benefits and Welfare Fund, Julie McKinney, Head of Social Security Strategy, Welfare Fund and Winter Benefits, and Stephanie Verlozier, Lawyer, Scottish Government Legal Department. So thank you all of you for joining us today. Following this evidence session, the, commit the committee will be invited uh, in the upcoming agenda item to consider the motion to approve the instrument. I remind everyone that Scottish Government officials can speak under this item, but not in the debate that follows. Before I invite the Cabinet Secretary to make a short opening statement, I would like to remind members, everyone indeed, about the active legal proceedings regarding winter fuel payments. Under the Parliament's subjudice rule, members should avoid making any statement about the subject matter of those proceedings, although the rule does not restrict consideration of legislation in itself. Members and witnesses should therefore ensure they focus their remarks on the regulations, specifically the regulations we are considering today, and avoid straying into wider matters that relate to those legal proceedings. Can I now invite the Cabinet Secretary to make her opening statement? Uh, thank you very much and good morning, Convener. With just weeks before our original regulations were to be laid in Parliament, the UK Government announced a significant change in policy which had a devastating consequence for our delivery of a universal benefit. Nevertheless, this marks a significant milestone in the delivery of our winter heating benefits, following the introduction of our child winter heating payment in 2020 and our winter heating payment which replaced the UK Government's unreliable cold weather payments last February. Whilst the provisions laid out in these regulations are not what I had anticipated we would be delivering, they will help ensure vital support is, able to eligible, is available to eligible pensioners with their fuel bills this winter, who will otherwise be without support. My officials engaged extensively on the proposals for delivery of our universal benefits, and we received a record number of responses to our consultation, with over 900 individuals and stakeholders taking the time to provide their views on the delivery of this benefit, for delivery now and in the future. Given the late notice of the UK Government's decision and the timescales for delivering this benefit, it has not been possible to engage further on the revised policy. The Scottish Government acknowledges that there are other pensioners who are likely to face financial difficulty and who would benefit from this support. However, given the significant reduction in funding expected to deliver pension age winter heating payment, it is no longer practicable to deliver this on a universal basis. We will continue to call on the UK Government to reverse their decision to mean test winter fuel payments and reinstate the payment for all pensioners. And I have committed to keeping the eligibility and the scope of pension age winter heating payment under review going forward to ensure that, where possible, we maximise the impact of the benefit. Our focus now is in is our focus now is on ensuring those eligible pensioners receive the support they are entitled to this winter. It is no longer possible for Social Security Scotland to deliver this benefit this year, and therefore the Department for Work and Pensions will deliver this on our behalf under agency agreement. 
While Social Security Scotland will have no role in administering pension age winter heating payment this winter, officials have been working closely with the UK Government to ensure they are prepared to deliver the functions required of them under the Social Security Scotland Act. In Scotland, we actively encourage people to apply for the benefits they are eligible for and strive to make applying as easy as possible, supporting them at every step of the way. So whilst, winter, whilst pension credit, um, will, which will be central to increasing take-up of our new winter heating benefit, is a reserved benefit, and Scottish ministers have no official role in administering it, my officials have been engaging with a number of stakeholders to help raise awareness of the link between pension credit and the entitlement to pension age winter heating payment. This will ensure we can reach as many people as possible this winter. Under these regulations, pensioners in Scotland who are in receipt of a relevant benefit will be paid £200 or £300, dependent on their age, and this will be paid to them automatically. I am immensely grateful to the members of the Scottish Commission on Social Security, who have given their time and engaged constructively with officials on the draft regulations shared with them in April, and for agreeing to scrutinise these regulations retrospectively. Wherever possible, we will always aim to give them sufficient time for scrutiny ahead of laying regulations. However, in these circumstances, this has not been possible. And I welcome the opportunity today to assist the committee in its consider consideration of the regulations. Okay, thank you, uh, Cabinet Secretary. And we will now move to uh, questions from uh, MSP colleagues. And uh, can I ask Katie Clark if she would kick us off? Thank you. Cabinet Secretary, why do you feel that you have no choice but to follow the UK government policy in this matter? Uh, well, as I alluded to in my um, opening remarks, the UK Government's changes to winter fuel payment eligibility will reduce the Scottish block grant by um, uh, an estimated £150 million in 2024-25. That's over 80% of the costs of the Scottish Government's replacement benefit, uh, particularly given the Chancellor's decision was taken without notice, despite officials from both governments working closely on the Social Security programme. That late decision and the financial constraints and that lack of prior consultation with the Scottish Government, ministers have reluctantly concluded that eligibility must be restricted to those in receipt of a relevant qualification. Benefit. To what extent did you explore other options? Um, we clearly had a public consultation which um, was uh, delivered, and I have referred to that in my opening um, remarks. Uh, the time constraints um, that we had it made it very difficult, and also the practicalities of moving forward made it very difficult. Uh, but with uh, respect, I will uh, keep my remarks uh, to those general considerations given the live legal proceedings. The members will be picking up some of these themes, so thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Katie. Uh, can I ask Midi McNair? Thank you, Convener, and, and good morning, Cabinet Secretary and your officials. Um, it is welcome, obviously, that the First Minister wrote to councils um, to seek assistance, obviously, um, in the drive to increase uh, pension credits. Uh, I'm really aware of the good work that's been done in my own constituency and across Scotland. I'm just wondering if the Cabinet Secretary will put on record her appreciation uh, of those local authorities and the work they're doing to, to, to get the, the pension credit uh, take up. Uh, well, well, I think you raise a very important um, point. Many um, uh, organisations, different parts of government, have done what they can to increase that pension credit, and I would pay uh, tribute to uh, the work that councillors have done, also to, to many MSPs uh, who have uh, done their own proactive work to encourage their constituents to come forward and claim what they are eligible for. We've always known that uh, the uptake of pension credit was uh, challenging and that needed to be increased, um, and I'm delighted to see that councils have again taken that uh, uh, very proactive and encouraging um, um, response uh, to the situation that we're in this year. So I would thank them and indeed everyone else, including the many organisations, uh, third sector charities and so on, uh, that have done their utmost to increase uh, the, the uptake of pension credit. Thank you. I'm sure they appreciate that. Um, receipt of uh, council tax reduction uh, can, in some cases, be a good indication that a uh, pension credit claim should be also made. Um, are you aware of uh, examples of council tax reduction records being used uh, to help tag target pensioners um, who may be entitled uh, to, to pension credit? 
Well, I'm sure a number of councils have undertaken a, a number of uh, different uh, pieces of work on this, and I think the, the point that you raise is an interesting one about how we share that good practice uh, across councils and across uh, the board. And if there's anything that the government can do on that, we'd be happy to assist. Thank you. Just back to yourself, could we OK, uh, thank you, Marie. Um, can I now pass to Paul Keane? Thank you very much, Convener, and good morning to Cabinet Secretary and officials. Um, in terms of perhaps following on from where Katie Clark left off, in terms of what flexibility um, for any change in approach uh, that was available to Scotland, because obviously this is a devolved benefit, um, I'm just keen to understand, uh, and the Cabinet Secretary has heard me speak about this before, what consideration was given to the consequentials that will come from the Household Support Fund. Now, um, the Cabinet Secretary and I have debated this previously, and I think the Cabinet Secretary said she was sceptical about the £41 million of consequentials that came from that fund. I would hope that, given yesterday, uh, she is less sceptical about the money that will, will come to Scotland. So I I'm keen to understand, because I think there is a, a genuine debate and a bit of a consensus around what more could be done. I think the Cabinet Secretary used the expression to maximise the impact of the payment, um, to, to see how the criteria could be widened. So I wonder to what extent she has given consideration to that, and also given that we know that in the intervening period in Northern Ireland, the, the devolved administration there has given consideration, uh, along with DWP and others, as to how they might use consequentials that flow from the Household Support Fund in order to widen the, the, the criteria. Uh, so we have indeed had that discussion uh, uh, um, um, prior to the UK uh, government budget. Given it was only um, yesterday, uh, uh, as I, I think uh, um, Paul O'Kane would uh, appreciate, we are still working through the finer detail um, of the budget. Uh, we have uh, said that the budget includes uh, proposals, uh, in, certainly in some aspects, that are a step in the right direction. Uh, but uh, I hope you would appreciate we are still going through the details um, of that. Um, clearly, um, we will then be able to take into consideration um, if there are consequentials uh, flowing from that, um, how they could be used across government, including on this aspect. So, um, sure, consideration sure, sure. will be happening within the government um, if there are consequentials, how much they are, mm -hmm. and what they could be used on. And I'd be happy to, to again carry on those conversations with Paul O'Kane once we're a bit further down the track of, of analysing the, the fine detail of the budget yesterday. Of course, and I appreciate there's a lot to get through um, in three. Uh, 1.5 billion a year of extra consequentials. Um, I just wonder, to though, she would accept that the household support fund has been extended. It's been extended beyond the six-month period uh, for a, a full year. Um, the Chancellor has announced that, so she would accept that there will be Barnet consequentials, and that the estimate from I think House of Commons Library was 41 million to Scotland. She would, she would accept that there will be consequentials. So it does appear that there will be additional consequentials. Uh, again, you'll be, uh, forgive me slightly if um, I anticipate over the next couple of days a, a number of um, calls will be made on how to spend those consequentials, and they often add up to a lot more than the consequentials that were given. So there may be additional consequentials coming, uh, but the important ask um, of government, I think, at this point is to analyse that. I accept that uh, uh, Mr Kane has uh, made made calls uh, right from the start on this. Uh, I would say other colleagues from his party, other parties, will ask us to spend those consequentials perhaps in different ways. And as I say, the total often adds up to more than the money. But with all those caveats, I absolutely do take his point and be happy to carry on that conversation uh, with him and, and, and colleagues as we move forward and progress onto the budget. I'm grateful uh, for that. And I, I wonder if just finally to help me understand, because I think we've agreed the principle that, that there could be flexibility in terms of um, the offer to, to pensioners more widely. I think we've accepted that there are consequentials there, um, notwithstanding what the Cabinet Secretary has just said. But I, I, I'm keen to understand the nature of the system that was built by Social Security Scotland. So my understanding from my discussions and, and our debates is that the system is a universal system that was built by um, Social Security Scotland and therefore cannot be changed. Now, I'm, I'm keen to understand why that was the case, because, of course, notwithstanding where we are now, 
It may have been the decision of a future Scottish Government of any uh, stripe to change eligibility up or down or, 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 or whatever. I mean, for example, people might decide that millionaires, for example, shouldn't receive the winter fuel payment. That's, that's a view. So I'm just keen to understand why was there no flexibility in the system that was built by Social Security Scotland, or am I incorrect in my, my, my view there? Uh, no, the, the system was built on uh, uh, the assumption that the Scottish Government's policy intent of a universal benefit would be carried out. Um, and uh, uh, theoretically, uh, a system could be built within the agency uh, that could um, cope with a myriad of different um, issues. Uh, but I think uh, we would then be getting challenged on why are you building a system um, trying to second guess what may or may not happen in the future and why are you wasting resources on that? You should be building the system for what the policy intent of the government was. So that was what the policy intent was. That's what we intended to deliver. That's what the system um, was built on. Now, clearly, the system can be changed. The system will have to be changed for, for, for next year. That will require work. That's additional expense. Um, each um, each uh, suggestion that the the system could do something different requires to be built, requires uh, funding to allow it that to be built. So these things take time. It couldn't be changed overnight, which is why um, we have uh, had to rely on the DWP this year, because the system could not just be uh, changed um, over the time frame that we were given. Um, but it can be changed uh, for next year. It could be changed in a myriad of, of different ways, but I hope the committee would expect that the systems are built based on the policy intent that government wants to take through. Not some, you know. I mean, I, I'm not sure how many, how we could guess, second guess what's going to happen in the future and how many different variations of that you'd want to build a system for. But that's a highly inefficient way to build the system. Mr. O'Kane, just before you come you come back in, um, and you, you may want to come back in. We are just moving just slightly away from the regulations themselves. I am not going to stop you coming back in. And just to note that uh, Marie McNeil has asked for a supplementary on this. But if you want to finish your line of questioning, Mr Cain, and then I will take Marie McNeil in. Thank you. I, I appreciate uh, your comments, convener, and I will, I will finish on this, this question. I, I, just on the, the point about flexibility, so just, just so I am clear, the Cabinet Secretary is saying that the system could not be changed for this year, so there, there could not be additionality put into the system. It has to be uh, the replication of what has been uh, done at DWP. Am I correct in saying there is no flexibility in the system this year? The system was built for a universal benefit, which was the intent of the Scottish Government. Uh, given how long it takes to build a social security system, no, it can't be done in just a couple of weeks that you could change that for this year. No flexibility in the system whatsoever? The, it was built for a universal benefit. That was what it was built for. OK. Thank you, Convener. OK. Thank you very much, Mr O'Kane. Uh, Marie McNair. Thank you, Convener. And just on in the back of um, Paul O'Kane's uh, comments there, um, Cabinet Secretary, you wrote to the um, UK Government uh, back in September. Obviously, you were kind of concerned, obviously, you know, about the amount of mitigation that you're doing and obviously you're saying that you know you, you can continue to, to mitigate against UK policies um, and obviously we're in this kind of you know read my lips no, no austerity etc but um, what reply did you get to that letter I'm just kind of really interested to see what response you got back from the UK government if that's okay <clears throat> um, well the, the response is um, in, in many ways was made clear during the, the budget yesterday. Uh, the two-child cap wasn't lifted. The other changes around the bedroom tax, uh, it wasn't scrapped, and therefore we'll have to continue to mitigate those, which are around £134 million that we mitigate against the worst excesses of some of the welfare policies already. Thank you. Yeah, and supplementary Katie Clark. Thank you, convener. And um, in the context of scrutinising these regulations, to what extent did you look at what's happening south of the border, in particular by councils, because half a billion pounds was announced in July of additional support to councils in England to help support with fuel poverty, and I believe further money was announced yesterday. So I just wonder to what extent you've looked at what's happening um, down south in terms of additional support, particularly to pensioners with fuel poverty. Uh, well, 
clearly there are aspects that are available um, in England, but uh, within um, Scotland we also have um, policy support which is not available um, in England. So I would give you an example of <clears throat> the Scottish Welfare Fund. So if I could interject, if, if maybe uh, I, I quite understand you might want to speak about some of the things you have done, but what I'm asking really is what, to what extent you've looked at what some councils are doing down south, because there's a number of different approaches, and I just wondered to what extent you'd looked at them in the context of the policy and regulations that we're considering today. To what extent you've looked at what's happening south of the, the border? Have you asked for briefings? Have you been briefed? Clearly, as we look to see how we could use any consequentials, if indeed there are consequentials, uh, then ministers will receive advice on um, alternative ways that we can uh, provide support to pensioners that is in addition to what's already provided that's not available in England. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Katie Clark. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, I just one one brief supplementary. It may be one for you to reflect on right back to the committee, because I suspect we will return to this, this policy matter once the subjudice case is uh, disposed of one way or another. Um, can I ask the Scottish Government to maybe consider how much notice would have been required from the UK Government of its intention to scrap universality in relation to winter fuel payments for pensioners to allow the Scottish Government to pivot and to seriously consider any other alternatives or mitigations? And my, my second thing for ask the Scottish Government to reflect on would be, of course, other measures and mitigations can only be brought forward if the Scottish Government knows the cash it has in its pocket, so to speak. So how much notice would you have, would you have to have, Cabinet Secretary, or the Scottish Government have about the financial settlement for this financial year, which can still be revised, and for the following financial year, to allow you to budget appropriately to do something different. Now, you may see Cabinet say that's drifting from the regulations, in which case, could you bag that and maybe write back to the committee at a later date? But clearly the lines of question we've had so far from members is that what different could have been done. So that would be helpful information, Cabinet Secretary. It's, I'd certainly be happy to provide further information to the committee in writing about how um, quickly changes to social security uh, systems can be made. I mean, clearly this is a, a, an issue which all social security systems uh, have, is, is uh, how quickly they can be changed. So I'll refer in writing if that's a uh, convenient convener. I think that might be helpful for future scrutiny, Cabinet Secretary. I, I appreciate that. Uh, can I move on to Jeremy Balfour now? Uh, good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Good morning to your uh, officials. It's uh, good to have you here. A um, couple of questions. Um, just going forward now to next year, where I think the presumption is that Social Security Scotland would take over delivering this, um, just reassurance, are they able to deliver that, but would it have to be delivered under the universal system only? <clears throat> uh, no. Uh, by next... So, uh, so, uh, to be absolutely clear, had, had we been able to go forward with a universal benefit, Social Security Scotland were ready to do that. So there was no issues um, um, at our end about taking that forward. Um, clearly, um, by next year, that will give us more time to be able to adapt the system. The system will be changed in, in, uh, in, in enough time to be able to allow the agency to deliver next year. I'm confident of that. OK, that, that's helpful. Thank you. Uh, just going back to delivery, did you you consider any different eligibility or would that simply ruled out immediately because the system wouldn't let you do it? Um, clearly the consultation um, that we had um, allowed people to make um, responses on different types of um, um, of payment uh, both now and in the future. Um, so that was um, an important part of the consultation um, that was uh, carried out, and there were uh, differing views um, within that. Uh, the options that were then available uh, to the government when we got the information through um, were um, much more uh, narrow. Um, we had built a system based on universality, um, which was the system that we would have been able to deliver. Um, and if we were unable to deliver it, um, then 
um, it would have to replicate what it would have to be something that the DWP could do under an agency agreement. So we were in a, a, a much narrower field at that point of options, practical options that were available to us. That's helpful. Just to pursue that one further, then, what did you have any discussions with DWP in regard to the agency agreement of doing something slightly different here in Scotland compared? And did DWP come back and say, we don't have resources to do that? Or did you have that discussion with them? Uh, uh, Mr Balfour, uh, uh, you and I have had many conversations over many years on uh, the nuances of agency agreements and, and you and I both know that the agency agreement is to absolutely follow what the DWP do. There has never been any options uh, for the Scottish Government to do anything different. That's not how the agency agreements um, work. So we would not I, I have got into that. that I'm just asking, did you try to have that discussion or did you just think there's no point in even having that discussion? The, 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 the agency agreement works um, in, in one way and, and in one way only, and that's to um, the DWP to carry out as they do for the rest of the UK. That that's, uh, has, has been the case all the way through. If there had been much, much, much more time for us to get into nuanced discussions with the DWP, there may have been a way, may have been a way to do something different. It would have been at cost to the Scottish Government, and it would have um, had to be the DWP that would have allowed us to do that. But it's never happened. It's never been an option uh, to, to do that. And it's certainly not something, again, that could in any way, shape or form be negotiated uh, quickly and at speed. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr Balfour. Uh, there have been no other questions from what I can see from, from members. We would now... Uh, 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 uh. Oh, I, I hear that may not be the case. There's nothing in my chat box. Ah, I see the name uh, Kevin Stewart twice now in my chat box. Mr Stewart, over to you. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, uh, it is a, a pity uh, that we kind of broaden out some of the questions, but obviously there is the sub judice situation because of the current uh, court si uh, situation. So I'm going to stick to um, what is in front of us in terms of the regulations. And uh, first of all, uh, Cabinet Secretary, I, I take it that you uh, wish... Uh, that these were different regulations that you were laying in front of us today? Well, very much. I mean, the, the consultation uh, that we had uh, gave a, a clear indication about uh, the fact that uh, the vast majority of people wished a universal benefit. That was the Scottish Government's um, intent. Uh, we uh, believe in universality uh, for benefits uh, for a number of reasons. Um, but clearly that comes up against a harsh reality uh, sometimes, and that is the situation that we're in um, at the moment. So it is with deep disappointment that I sit here um, asking the committee to, to pass these regulations today. Um, thank you uh, very much, Cabinet Secretary. Um, I, want, I want to turn to what was a bit of a shock decision um, by the UK government in terms of uh, this policy. Uh, and, of course, the removal um, of, uh, of monies to the Scottish Government. Can I ask uh, a general question uh, around about respect? Um, can I ask if the Government uh, has raised this and will raise this with the UK Government around about the respect agenda when it comes to intergovernmental relations, rather... Uh, than having to deal with a uh, change in policy which has sprung uh, uh, upon you unawares. Because I understand, and you've uh, said so um, in your opening remarks, that discussions between your civil servants um, and UK civil servants about the transfer um, of these powers and, of course, the resources had been going on for some time. Can you give us an indication of how long mm. uh, you had uh, before the announcement um, uh, in terms of the knowledge about what the UK government was about to do and whether you think that was respectful? 
well, we, we didn't have any for, forewarning um, um, of that. Um, there's an irony to that as well, because um, um, it's well rehearsed uh, that the intergovernmental relations with the previous UK government were exceptionally uh, difficult. Uh, but even during the worst of those uh, phases, we had an exceptionally good working relationship um, um, on the operational levels between the DWP and, uh, and the Scottish Government. Um, that was one of the few areas that carried on um, um, with a, a respectful way of going. We've never had this before. We gen we've genuinely just never had this situation um, before. Um, and the irony is, of course, that wider intergovernmental relations uh, have improved. In saying that, um, I've made my uh, views on this uh, very clear uh, to the Secretary of, of State. We've had those discussions and we now need to move forward. Um, I, I hope and, and, I, and I do believe there is, is a, a greater uh, recognition that we're in a very different phase now with uh, the devolution of Social Security that a change like this uh, will have an immediate impact and potentially um, if it's uh, relating to um, a benefits such as this or dis disability benefits um, it has very, very big consequences for in-year or future year uh, expenditure. Um, so we've, we've had this very difficult phase, um, um, but we've had that discussion. Uh, the Minister, the Secretary of State and I have had that discussion um, we're, um, and we're keen to, to move on so it doesn't happen again. But that responsibility is with the DWP to ensure that's happened. I've been given those reassurances um, and I will take the Secretary of State at her word on that. Um, but we can't have this happening again because otherwise I will be in front of committee um, with um, other areas potentially where the government doesn't want to make changes but has been obligated or, or um, uh, forced into a position that we didn't want to get into. Um, thank you. Um, obviously, um, this change in policy by the UK government and its impact here um, also has a major effect on uh, people uh, living uh, in the real world. Um, you spoke earlier about some of the mitigations that the Scottish Government have in place around about the Scottish Welfare Fund and discretionary housing payments. But can I ask, because a lot of this now falls on pension credit, what discussions have you had with the Secretary of State about the UK Government uh, putting in place um, a campaign to ensure that all of those folks who are entitled to pension credit get pension credit and therefore get um, the winter fuel payments? Uh, well, I think it is a very important point um, that you raise around benefit take-up in general. Um, clearly, one of the first uh, asks that I made uh, to the Secretary of State was around the benefit um, take-up. Um, I appreciate some uh, work has been undertaken um, on this um, area uh, by the DWP. Um, and um, I, I hope and, and we have seen um, a, a, an uptake um, increase, an increase in the uptake, um, but we uh, are still keen to see what more can be done. As I said in my opening remarks, um, we are keen to play the role um, as the Scottish Government uh, that we can, even though uh, pension credit is not our uh, benefit. Local authorities have, have played a role, others have as well. But I am very keen that the DWP do, in essence, what the Scottish Government has had for some time, which is a benefit take-up strategy. And we are the only um, um, country in the UK that has a benefit take-up strategy. So pension credit is important. Other, take up, uh, other benefit take-up is also important, and that is why that wider uh, take-up strategy is important too. Uh, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Convener. Okay, thank you, Mr Stewart. Now, this time, I think there have been no further questions. We will now move to Agenda Item 3, which is still on the subordinate legislation, Motion SXM 14682. Uh, so... Uh, we have to ask that the, so the Social Justice and Social Security Committee recommend that the, the Winter Heating Assistance Pension in Scotland Regulations Draft be approved. Can I call on the Cabinet Secretary to move the motion in the first instance and speak to the motion if she wishes to? Moved, Convener. Okay. 
That being formally moved, there is the opportunity for members to contribute in a debate in relation to this. Does any member wish to speak? So I can see uh, Mr Balfour wishes to speak. Can I ask Clarks if anyone else wishes to speak to put names in, in the chat function? Uh, Mr Balfour. Um, thank you, Convener. I mean, clearly this is a place that I wish we weren't in. Um, I agree in regard to um, a lot of what the Cabinet Secretary said this morning. Um, I think this was a, a, a very strange and bad decision by the UK Government, and it will have a real effect on many of our constituents' lives. I understand why these regulations have been brought forward. However, I am concerned in regard to the bigger picture of how Social Security Scotland works and the systems that they have in place. From what we've heard this morning, it would seem to me that if the Scottish Government had wanted to look at some kind of different criteria of doing it in a different way, that was simply impossible to do because the system was designed in one way. That gives me concern because it gives a very fixed system without any flexibility within it. I am concerned that going forward we may end up next year, depending on what decisions have been made in this year's budget, but also what decisions are made by the UK Government going forward, that we, they may change that criteria and how quickly can Social Security respond to that? Um, I do appreciate the Cabinet Secretary. I would welcome her to perhaps write to the committee in regard to how quickly can Social Security Scotland redesign a system and amend a system. Is it weeks, months, or how long does it take? Because I think we do not want to get ourselves into a position next year where we have to go back and do another agreement with DWP, because that has a financial cost to us all. So I am uh, disappointed that we're having to make these decisions. It will affect real people, but I think there is also a bigger picture going forward of how Social Security Scotland actually works and can it deliver what we as a parliament want. Thank you, Mr Balfour. Uh, Paul O'Kane? Uh, I'm, I'm very grateful, convener, and um, I, I don't intend to re-rehearse debates that we've had already, uh, not least in the Chamber, and I would point to my line of questioning to the Cabinet Secretary in terms of my reflection of where we are. Of course, we want to ensure that um, those uh, who are uh, in a qualifying criteria are able to receive the payment, and um, that is uh, pension credit, and of course to ensure that uptake of that is as robust as possible. We also are, are keen to see, I think, more work, certainly at a UK level, to continue to increase uh, both the uptake of pension credit, but also the availability of that uh, payment to more people, not least through uh, its connection to housing benefit and looking at uh, the wider criteria as well. But as I say in terms of my line of questioning, in terms of my consistency throughout this debate and discussion, I am concerned about the Scottish Government's uh, lack of utilisation of those Barnet consequentials that we will see through the Household Support Fund. I do believe there has been an opportunity to do more, um, and I would point again to the work that has been ongoing with the Executive in Northern Ireland. Uh, and I do think also that, um, that there has been an opportunity to look again at the flexibility of the system. I do have concerns that um, the social security system have to be built to be flexible because things do change and develop uh, and there are of course varying views so there has to be a, a built-in flexibility. So naturally uh, in this debate I recognise the need to ensure that payments uh, go out but I do have a number of concerns which I have put on the record here today. Thank you convener. Uh, thank you Mr O'Kane. Katie Clark. Thank you. Um, I mean we obviously are dealing with the regulations here today um, but it is concerning that the Cabinet Secretary hasn't been able to say more 
about the plans in Scotland in relation to the half billion pounds of additional funds that were made available in England for household um, support, because we know that councils in England are using that money to make payments to many pensioners who lost out as a result of the decision taken by the Westminster Government. Um, I don't have the figure of the additional funds that were available yesterday, and it would be interesting to hear from the Cabinet Secretary once she's clear what the kind of consequentials um, of the budget yesterday will be in relation to this aspect of policy. Um, but we have to look at the regulations that we have before us today um, and take a decision on the basis of those regulations. Um, but I would say to the Cabinet Secretary um, that there is more that could be done despite the decision that's been taken to, by Westminster. And I would hope that she'd be in a position um, to look at that in detail and to look at what's happening down south, um, to look at what happened in July in terms of funding, but also in the budget yesterday to look at what more can be done in Scotland this winter. Thank you, Katie Clark. Kevin Stewart. Um, thank you, convener. Um, and I think it's uh, agreed that uh, none of us want to be in the position of passing these regulations today, but uh, it's a necessity. Um, we are where we are uh, because of the shock decision uh, by the UK government uh, to end universality when it came to winter fuel payments, which is an impact uh, on our budget here. Um, and, uh, you know, we can debate until uh, the cows come home around about what is available in terms of funding from uh, other announcements and from the budget yesterday. But as we've been sitting here uh, in this meeting, I'm sitting watching various arguments uh, around about what will be available and what, what will not be available here. Uh, and I don't envy the Cabinet Secretary um, uh, or her colleagues, uh, particularly the Finance Secretary, in terms of trying to get to grips of what the budget actually means for us. Um, what I do recognise um, from the discussions that have been today, but also previously, um, is that the Cabinet Secretary does not want to be in this position um, and wants to do better um, for the people of Scotland. And I'm quite sure um, that uh, she will come back with proposals. Because I talked about the shock that we had, which obviously the government had, around about these changes. But the real shock is for the folk out there whose expectation were that they would be getting winter payments um, this coming year, many of whom who are not. Um, and I think that the short-term uh, situations that take place in this country where shock comes into play is uh, unacceptable. Uh, and UK governments need to take cognizance of that bef uh, and not do things like this um, in the future. Um, I also recognise the point that Mr Balfour has made um, around about um, the DWP. But for those of us who have uh, followed the discussions over many years um, in terms of the DWP um, and its lack of flexibility um, in terms uh, of its attitude to the Scottish Government in the past, are not surprised that there was no flexibility from the DWP um, in terms of this issue. So I think um, the shock scenario is the worst aspect of this, uh, not only, I'm sure, for the Scottish Government, but in particular for those folks out there that had expectations about payments this year. Thank you, convener. Thank you very much, Mr Stewart. Um, I'll take the opportunity to make a few remarks myself, if there's no other members wishing to, to contribute. I, I wish to, to reflect on Mr Balfour's comments about could the system be designed to be more flexible and effectively designed for a targeted system should this eventuality happen. I'm just thinking of the politics. Genuinely, sincerely, Mr Balfour, the politics had the Scottish Government spent money to a system that could change winter fuel payments to a targeted payment rather than a universal payment. I think some in this in this committee, possibly Mr Balfour, would have uh, been wringing their hands about the additional costs that would take, and that must mean the Scottish government's got a policy intent to move towards targeting. Perhaps I'm an unfair Mr Balfour, but I do know that Mr Balfour's always been very clear in the past that perhaps we don't need a Scottish 
social security system and that we should deliver it all from Westminster. Um, so I, I, I think the re flexibility... Will you remember taking intervention on that point? Of, co of course I will, Mr Balfour, yes. Would Mr Dodge point to one occasion in this committee that I've said that thing? Could you, could you just clarify? Because I have never said that we don't need a social security system here in Scotland. I was proud to be on the committee that brought it forward. Could you point to one occasion when I said that? I'll, I'll tell you what I would be happy to do, Mr Balfour, if you really want me to do this. I will look on the official report for occasions in the chamber or in committee where you've questioned why we're building this system in the first place and perhaps it would be cheaper. You've, you've scrutinised the cost of the system and said it might be more affordable and cheaper just to run it from Westminster. And if you haven't said that, I'll happily apologise, Mr Balfour, but I think that's been a pretty consistent position of yours. But let's not personalise it between us. I think the point I was trying to make is there's a balance between a flexible system and a system which is value for money and cost effective and delivers the policies that we intend to do. And that's the only point I was trying to make Mr Balfour some apologies. I didn't mean to trigger you in relation to that contribution, but I thought Katie Clark was incredibly helpful in her contribution, because Katie Clark, uh, and I uh, hope I've captured you correct, Katie, um, said what more could have been done despite uh, the, de the decision from Westminster. And that kind of talks about mitigations, and I won't mention mitigations because I want to stay away from the, the politics of this, but Katie also said ask what more could be done uh, once Barnet consequences have become clear. And again, that points towards an uncertainty in the Scottish budget, not just until the Chancellor Exchequer gets to their feet, but until the consequences of that are known. So I think we are where we are, and we all understand why that's the case. And it isn't really a moment for politics. My understanding is we don't pass... Would the convener uh, take an intervention? I don't know of, if it's appropriate to intervene in the convener um, in that capacity. Yes, of course it is. Um, I think um, the convener probably also heard me say that it was quite clear what the consequentials were in relation to the announcement from July, which was half a billion pounds of money at a UK level um, for the Household Support Fund, and we know that that's a £41 million consequential for the Scottish Government. As he knows, my colleague Paul O'Kane, as our policy lead from Scottish Labour on this issue, has consistently been asking that that money should go to the poorest pensioners in Scotland and to people that are losing out as a result of the decision at Westminster, um, and that that is something that could perhaps be done by councils. Um, is, is, does the does Bob, Bob, or Boris, does Bob Doris accept um, that we know there's £41 million? We knew that from July, um, but we're still waiting for confirmation of the precise um, figure in relation to yesterday. I do have a figure, but I don't know if it's accurate. Um, but we do know we've got the £41 million, but we may have um, quite a considerable further sum. Does he accept that? I, first of all, Katie Clark is completely... A etiquette to intervene on the community, you absolutely should do, given that I specifically mentioned your, your comments. I think you again make a really important point, Katie, uh, because there will always be in your revisions to budgets, sometimes they go up and down, and you've identified one, Ms Clark, which is a budget that is going up, but there's lots of other budgets that are going down within year revisions and the Scottish Government is going to look at things in the round. So I'll be I'll look forward to see what decisions the Scottish Government does make. And of course our committee should scrutinise that on a cross party basis. So I think that was a very helpful intervention. Uh, but but that said, I think none of us want to be in a position where uh, we let politics get in the way of delivering this important winter fuel payment to some of the most vulnerable pensioners. We wish, I suspect most of us or all of us, that it was on a universal basis, but it's not to be so at this stage. Uh, and I'll leave my comments at, at, at that for the moment. Do any other members wish to come in before I pass back to the Cabinet Secretary? OK, Cabinet Secretary, um, you, you may wish to uh, sum up uh, uh, during the debate, or you may wish to uh, waive that right. It's fully up to you. Uh, I'll, I'll make a, a couple of points if I, if I can, um, Convener. Uh, we need to be really clear about what happens with consequentials. Just because, just because um, a, a Secretary of State says that something might happen in July, 
is not an appropriate way for us then to decide how to use that money. Because as you say yourself, convener, while something may indeed go up, other aspects may go down. So uh, I, with, 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 if I can just finish this point, if, 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 if I may, Ms Clark. Um, I, 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 and, I'm, and, and I have that scepticism coming from the fact I sat literally two weeks or so before this announcement on the winter fuel was, payments were made, being told that we would work together and there'd be no surprises, and yet here we are. So, so people will forgive me if I am slightly sceptical about seeing um, an announcement being made and me not immediately thinking that that is going to result in an increase in funding. And when it comes to the budget yesterday, absolutely, let's look at that. Again, my ask is, um, we just need to be careful because, I, I, again, from experience, whatever consequentials, positive consequentials will be coming, the asks on the Scottish Government to use them will be much, much more than the consequentials were given because uh, I respect that the fact that Mr O'Kane um, and indeed uh, um, um, Katie Clark have been uh, very consistent on this issue. We will have other calls from other um, um, MSPs to use consequentials in different ways and we can only spend the money once if indeed it comes. And we just need to be very uh, cautious about taking that overall approach uh, to be able to, to use that. But if, if uh, um, it's up to the convener if I take an intervention, I presume, but I'm happy to take that if, if so the convener is content. I can see who's wishing to intervene, but I'm content for there to be an intervention, Cabinet Secretary. I, and I'd be um, very happy to make an intervention if the Cabinet Secretary is willing to take one. Um, so I, I fully appreciate that you haven't got the money yet from consequentials. Fully understand that. But of course, you have actually already got the money, as I understand it, um, from uh, the, the benefit of it had been a universal benefit. Um, but I appreciate there's going to be and an adjustment. But I suppose the principle is that there was money announced in July as a consequence of the decision by the UK Parliament to pass regulations um, which focused um, winter fuel on pension credit only. Um, and as a consequence of that, there was additional money, half a billion pounds, put into the Household Support Fund in Scotland. So the principle is that if money is announced to help poorer pensioners who've lost out as a result of a decision to means test winter fuel payment, that the principle should be that that money that's been given to the Scottish Government for that reason should be passed to those poorest pensioners. Don't you agree with that principle? So what I, what I would say um, is that, again, um, if Ms Clark agrees with that principle, she may want to check with everybody else in her, uh, in her Scottish Labour parliamentary group to ensure that the consequentials that we get, nobody double counts and asks us to spend more. Now, they may all agree on this aspect of the consequentials, but there will be other aspects where, and I say I, I speak from bitter experience, we get asked to spend money more than once and that's not the way you can make a budget. So I, I take the point that uh, particularly Katie Clark and Paul O'Kane have been very consistent on this issue, but year after year after year, whether it's block grant adjustments um, in year, whether it's in year adjustments or whether it's in the budget, we get more calls to spend money than the money that we have. And that is the reason I am sceptical uh, about it. But in saying all that, I am happy to work, of course, and to, um, I've heard the suggestions that have came forward. Um, if I can just, um, convener, if you can bear with me on one other yes. issue I wish to bring up. Um, all social security systems um, are built to deliver the policy intent of the government. And I, I would ask the committee to give some thought to exactly what they're asking the agency to do, because uh, Mr Balfour said he's disappointed it couldn't deal with flexibilities. How many flexibilities would the committee have wanted us to build into that system? Because we might have wanted to target it, or somebody might have wanted to target it, even if we didn't. 
Do you want us to do it in age? Do you want us to do it in benefit entitlements? Do you want to do it as whether they're in a couple or they're single? Do you want us to do it on geography? Do you want us to do it on income levels? There are so many different variations of a system that we could have theoretically built into it at great cost, and then we'd be back here, and I have no doubt that Mr Balfour would be quite rightly challenging us on why we've spent money building a system for something that the government doesn't intend to do, because the possibilities and variations are almost limitless. And if that's the type of system that Mr Balfour wants, that's not how Social Security is built, no. It's also not how any other Social Security system is built either. So let's be really cautious about what the practical challenges and the costs are of a suggestion that the system has to be more flexible because it has to be built with specifics and I've given but a few examples of how you could build a system to deal with theoretical changes that may or may not happen in the future under a different government and all of them would have been a waste of public resources. Uh, can I just check, Cabinet Secretary, that you, you've finished summing up in relation to the affirmative instruments? I am, Convener, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Therefore, to committee members, the question is that motion S6M14682 in the name of Shirley Ann Somerville be approved. Are we all agreed? No. no. Okay. We be not all agreed. We will then uh, move to a vote. Um, and a division will be held by a show of hands. Um, so, can I first of all ask those who agree to the firm of instrument being approved to raise your hands just now, please? And given that I'm remote, can I just ask the clerk to confirm how many people that is? I'm seeing three. Is, is that correct? Can members please help me here? Three, yes. So three uh, are in support of the affirmative instrument. Can I ask those that are against the affirmative instrument to raise your hand, please? I am seeing no votes against. Can I just ask the clerks to confirm that in our chat box? Thank you. Are there any abstentions? Can I ask you to raise your hands, please? So I am seeing... Four abstentions. Can I, again, can I just ask clerks to confirm that in the box? So there being three votes in favour, no votes against, and four abstentions, uh, the motion is therefore agreed to. Can I thank all members for their patience in uh, holding that vote? Uh, so following today's proceedings, a draft report will be prepared by the clerks. The committee is invited to decide whether to consider that draft report in private at its next meeting. Do members agree? Yeah, agreed. Yeah. Thank you. I don't see any member disagreeing with that. Thank you. Uh, can I therefore just uh, thank the Cabinet Secretary and your officials for uh, your contribution at today's meeting, but also to fellow committee members for how they conducted uh, the, the debate th this morning. Uh, so that concludes our public business today, and we now move into private session to consider the remaining agenda item. Thank you.